In the single variable calculus, the substitution rule was the most important technique for integration. It let me change a difficult function into an easier function, allowing many types of integrals to be calculated. In this video, I'm going to introduce the multivariable equivalent of the substitution rule, which is called change of variables. Let me start by reviewing what the substitution rule did. For a single variable definite integral, a substitution was a replacement of the variable x with a new variable u. It replaced all the pieces of the original integral. There is some relationship, u equals g of x, some function that does the substitution. Then there is also a relationship between the du and the dx pieces, what are sometimes called the differentials. This relationship is the derivative of the function g of x. Finally, the bounds change. The old bounds a to b in x change to the new bounds g of a to g of b in u. So if the substitution was u equals arctangent x, let me look at the pieces. I can invert this to get x equals tangent of u, which is the form this usually took as a common trig substitution. Then the dx term would be replaced with secant squared u du. The lower bound would become the arctangent of a, and the upper bound would become the arctangent of b. The main purpose of the substitution rule was to simplify the function. The interval a to b changed to a new interval g of a to g of b, but the interval was never the problem for single variable integrals, the function was the challenge. For multivariable integrals, this situation is going to switch. Usually, change of variables happens to simplify the domain, though using it to help with the function can also happen. Let me give you the basic theory of change of variables in this video before moving on to important instances in the following videos for this week. A substitution in single variable functions was itself a single variable function, however, Scalar fields have multiple variables. Let's say that I have a scalar field f with domain in Rn. Then a substitution, a change of variables, needs to be a function that changes the domain, that changes Rn. It needs to be a function from Rn to Rn, a function with n inputs and n outputs. I'll call this function capital F. It changes the original variables, the xi of the scalar field, to new variables ui. There are n of each, n inputs and n outputs. All of the xi get changed into new ui. I'll talk about how the regions of integration change in the particular cases in future videos, since it's pretty hard to say anything in general on the subject. But first, I also need to talk about how to change the differential pieces of the integral. The dx1, dx2, up to dxn needs to be switched to du1, du2, up to dun. What goes in this spot? Previously, it was the derivative of the transformation, but as we saw so often in previous weeks, the derivative of a multivariable function is no longer an easy thing. When I finished up talking about derivatives of scalar fields, the last thing I introduced was the Jacobian matrix. This was the matrix of all partial derivatives of a multivariable function. I argued that the Jacobian matrix was the best holistic idea for the derivative. If I wanted the derivative of a multivariable function, one thing to represent all these rates of change, then the Jacobian matrix is it. And the Jacobian matrix is what I'm going to use here. For a general function f from Rn to Rn, there are n inputs and n outputs. I can write the inputs as the variables xi and the outputs as f sub i, the pieces of the function. Then there are n squared partial derivatives. Each piece fi has a partial in each of the variables. So I can put these in a matrix, an n by n matrix. For those who don't have linear algebra, just think of this as a square box to keep track of all this information. I am not going to expect any matrix calculations from you in this course, but it does make sense to use the matrix language here. So bear with me while I do so. I have the Jacobian, but the Jacobian matrix itself can't fit in this spot in the differentials. These are not matrix equations. There is no room for a matrix here. Instead, I use the determinant. Again, for those of you who don't have linear algebra, don't worry about the calculation. I'm not going to ask you to do determinant calculations. The determinant is a number that I can get out of a matrix, a number that captures the effect the matrix has on size, area, volume, and hypervolume. This is the point. What the differential piece actually does in change of variables is adjust for the change in size, in area, volume, etc. That's also what it did for single variable integration, 
though I didn't talk about it that way in previous courses. When I changed variables, the notion of size of area of volume are changed. The new coordinates don't measure size the same as the old. There needs to be an adjustment, something that keeps track of how size changes, so that the integral still produces the same results. This Jacobian determinant does exactly that. It's the part of the matrix that measures the effect on size, so it fits perfectly into the change of variable program. That's all I'll say for now, though I will return to this change of size argument and hopefully make it more tangible in an example in the next video.